How's it going everybody? As we discussed last time, we're going to be starting a new project for the monthly Patreon videos. Everyone has showed so much interest in the comments for the phenomenon of evolution in island habitats that the patrons and myself have decided to begin a new series talking about these lost worlds in depth. This month's poll was a choice of all the islands from Earth's past that we've talked about in previous videos. Either in a list video, or a spotlight where I talked about one species that inhabited an island, or a segment in a larger story. But we've never talked about each of these island habitats in their entirety. This month, the island that was selected was Cretaceous Hatsag Island, one of the handful of options that's available before the Cenozoic Era. And just to let everyone know, the way that we'll be handling this moving forward is this month the vote will come down to all the previous options that were available last month, plus one more to replace the option that won. We'll continue like this for as long as I can think of new ideas on the topic, or as long as these videos do well, and then me and the Patreons will move on to a new topic. But that shouldn't be for a while, because there's a lot to discuss on the topic of how islands affect the evolution of animals who have been separated from their mainland cousins. And there may be no better example than the one that we will be discussing today, because the fossil beds discovered in the small village of Hattag, Romania may actually be one of the most fascinating Mesozoic deposits ever found. To start this tale, we first have to talk about the rather interesting man who discovered this lost world. Franz Nupschka. If I ever start a series about some of the most interesting people in the history of paleontology, I will definitely be talking about him a little bit more. Among other things, he was actually the first person to ever hijack a plane. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to talk about his contribution to the field of paleontology, specifically this one major contribution. Franz was the first to discover fossils in the Hatzag Basin in the Romanian Alps. The first animal that was found here was a sauropod known as Magyarosaurus. And this thing would be seen as truly peculiar because of its size. This was a titanosaur, literally the largest group of land animals that have ever existed. But it was comparatively tiny. I mean, it was still large if you compare it to many Cenozoic creatures, but in the Cretaceous it was pretty small, especially for a titanosaur. When the fossils were first discovered, they were actually thought to be a juvenile animal. But Franz had a different theory. He proposed that this is a case of animals getting smaller because of limited resources and being geographically isolated. This was the first ever proposal of island dwarfism or insular dwarfism and it would later be confirmed by skeletal analysis that the bones did belong to an adult animal, but a fraction of the size of its mainland cousins. And so, from this discovery, Franz Nupschka kind of became the founder of this entire theory of evolution. But what was this lost world of tiny dinosaurs really like? Going back to 70 million years ago, Romania and this entire area of the world looked very different than it does today. At this time, much of Europe was covered by a shallow sea called the Tethys, with small islands making up most of the habitable land in the region. A few larger islands did exist, like Hatsag, which was around 31,000 square miles or 80,000 square kilometers. It was also around 120 miles from any main landmass. There were other islands nearby from the formation of the Alps, but Hatsag also had another interesting feature. It was separated by a deep marine basin on most sides. This is what this part of the world looked like throughout much of the Jurassic and Cretaceous. But, as sea levels fluctuated, it would allow land animals to travel between the islands during times of lower sea level, and would be isolated during times when the sea levels would get higher. Now, the most likely place of origin for the greatest majority of species here would have been the mainland continent of Phenosarmicia, a landmass that would one day become northeastern Europe and Asia. The climate was hotter than today. Similar temperatures to Florida, but less humid. It was subtropical, with a cycle of dry and rainy seasons. However, the presence of abundant tropical vegetation suggests that lakes and rivers were probably present year-round. 
So one thing to think about is that many of the large herbivores lived migratory lives on the mainland in order to constantly find food, much like we see from large animals today. But on Hatsag Island, that was not an option. If they were cut off by the rising sea levels, they would only have the finite resources that were available on the island. So at that point, the only two options were to get smaller and require less food, or die out. And that's how these bizarre animals came to be. Creatures like the previously mentioned Magyarosaurus, a titanosaur the size of a buffalo, weighing around 1600 pounds, ironically equal to the size of some of the largest elephant birds that we talked about in the last episode. It was around 6 meters long, and only 2 meters tall, around 1 -seventh the length and height of typical titanosaurs. And then there was also Paluta Titan, another titanosaur that was slightly smaller than Magyarosaurus. We have Talmatosaurus, a hadrosaur that probably was about the size of a cow. At around 5 meters long, it was about half the size of most hadrosaurs, and Zalmoxes, an iguanodon the size of a sheep, which was around one-third the size of most iguanodons. And another thing that's interesting about this creature is the fact that it seems like they lived quite a bit longer than many of the mainland iguanodons, at least across the northern hemisphere across much of Eastern Europe, Asia, and North America, by the end of the Cretaceous, many of the Iguanodon species had died out, presumably because of being outcompeted by hadrosaurs, who had exploded in diversity in the latter half of the Cretaceous. But, somehow, these two species managed to coexist on this more limited island habitat. And then finally, we have Struthiosaurus, a nodosaur the size of a pig, around one-third to one-fourth the size of any mainland ankylosaurs or nodosaurs. Unfortunately, the only group of large Cretaceous herbivores that we don't have evidence of being present on Hatzag is the Ceratopsians, or horn dinosaurs. Aww, I want to see a little Triceratops piggy. With so many herbivores getting smaller, that meant that the large carnivorous theropods would have less to eat as well. And eventually, this would result in no theropods on the island being taller than an adult human, with the largest known carnivorous dinosaur being Heptestesteornis, a species that was originally thought to be a gigantic flightless prehistoric owl when incomplete remains were found in 1975, which is pretty ironic considering another island habitat would eventually produce a gigantic flightless owl. But that's a story for another time. These theropods would run into an issue, though, because a 120-pound animal would probably still struggle to hunt even the dwarf sauropods that were still 15 times their size. So they probably took to preying on smaller animals like reptiles and mammals, like the multi-tuberculate Barbadodon. This group of animals appeared to be very rodent-like, but are actually an entirely different group that first appeared all the way back in the Jurassic period. And then there would be what appears to be even smaller species of theropods, like Balatar Bondok, an animal that we believed originally to be a species of Dromaeosaur or Raptor when it was first discovered. But the discovery of a fully articulated set of arms actually showed that it had evolved from an avian ancestor. Meaning that rather than being a small carnivorous dinosaur, this was more than likely a species of bird that had re-evolved flightlessness after traveling to the island. Now, this was an easy mistake to make since raptors and birds share so many morphological similarities, especially during this time. There were even dwarf crocodilomorphs, such as Aprosuchus and Sabersuchus. These would have been able to prey on some of the different species of herbivorous dinosaurs, but would have been stuck in largely the same boat as the theropods. And with no large theropods or crocodilomorphs anywhere on the island, this never put any evolutionary pressure on the herbivores to maintain a large body size. This seems like the perfect place. Nothing will try to eat me here. You sure about that? Uh, I, I don't like when you say things like that.
At a glance, this would seem like a herbivore's paradise. Sure, the average animal was between one-fifth and one-tenth the size of their mainland relatives, but they didn't need to be that big. Large body size is, after all, quite expensive. So with no predators that could pose a threat, why bother? There would occasionally be influxes of new animals from Phenosarmicia or other nearby islands, like the recently discovered Transylvaniasaurus, but within a few generations, any animals trapped here would eventually change as a result to the ecological pressures of isolation. This would be the case for any animals that arrived but could not leave. But that was the key. If an animal could figure out how to easily come and go, they would negate the need to shrink and easily come to dominate this lost island in the middle of the Tethys Sea. And this would be accomplished by Hatsagopteryx, a species of as dark a pterosaur, the same group that includes the much more well-known Quetzalcoatlus. Although not as tall as its relative, it was heavier built with a short neck and massive skull, and it still sported a 10 to 12 meter wingspan. Meaning that despite being so large and stocky for a pterosaur, this animal could still fly. And that would be the secret that made this pterosaur the undisputed king of Hatsag Island. The fact that it could come and go from this island and was likely migratory meant that it would not have its size reduced by the effects of insular dwarfism. But the island would still have an effect on this animal's evolution. With a shorter, thicker neck, its stocky build and its large beak, even for an Asdarkid, were all adaptations to make this the most powerful carnivore on the island. With a skull that measured around 8 feet long, this animal would land on the island and look like a massive stork the height of a giraffe. With its more powerful build, it could snap up any of the island's residents with the possible exception of adult Magyarosaurus. This also means, even if Quetzalcoatlus may have been the tallest animal to ever fly and had the largest wingspan, that the true title of the biggest animal to ever fly in terms of body mass probably goes to its more robust cousin. Hatsag Island was our first glimpse into a phenomenon that we would eventually come to realize all life adheres to. Whether it's a giant animal of the Mesozoic, mammals or birds from the more recent past, or even the modern day, the same equation holds true. Geographic isolation plus time equals a reshuffling of the deck when it comes to animals filling ecologic niches. And this can oftentimes lead to giants, dwarfs, and completely new versions of creatures that we may be familiar with from mainland environments. During the Mesozoic, this is definitely the most well-known example, but this was definitely not the only time that this phenomenon took place. In fact, there are even examples from other places specifically throughout Western Europe that examples of dwarf dinosaurs have been found. And that makes sense considering this region spent so much of this era as an island archipelago. Chances are, Hatsag was just the last in a long line of islands with dwarf dinosaurs. And with that, I want to thank my patrons for voting on this video. It was a lot of fun researching, and I can't wait to continue looking at islands that have produced some of the most bizarre and remarkable animals that the world has ever seen. If you would like to vote on the next island habitat that I'll be checking out, go check out my Patreon. But if you just want to enjoy the ride, that's fine too. And hey, if you have any other ideas for videos that you would like to see, leave a comment below. Alright, that's all I have for today. Have a good one, everybody.